Today we have Albert Justiniano, and I would like to acknowledge our funding sources. We have funding from the New York Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, the Department of Youth Services, and the Puerto Rican Workshop Incorporated, which is our mother organization. Albert Hustuliano was born and raised in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, a native New Yorker. His paintings extrapolate views of cultural symbolism that evoke emotions which may have been unconscious from encounters and occurrences in life. Albert's paintings impart what is familiar, thus permitting space for one's interpretation. His work affords a haven to connect symbolically, spiritually, and culturally to one's life experiences. Albert merges his Puerto Rican culture's spiritual and religious characteristics, creating a surreal representation of everyday objects in unusual places. His works of art provide a sense of harmony while arousing mixed personal feelings amongst the viewers. Albert is a fine artist and he's also a teacher. Do you agree with what I just said about your work? A hundred percent. Yes, I, I was born and raised in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I lived there uh, for 29 years, um, living on Rivington Street between mm -hmm. Norfolk and Suffolk Street. Um, it was when I realized that um, I wanted to be an artist because of the environment. So many characters that play music and there was art everywhere. Um, and I was just growing up and I realized that, you know what, in my family there were musicians, there were lots of musicians. All my brothers, my father was a classical guitarist. father was a classical guitarist. Yeah, he was a classical guitarist yeah. and uh, he tried to get me into the music, into playing music and uh, I went to the, um, I think it was uh, Tito Puente School over here in Harlem when I was younger. There was a school down here that was a summer program and he put me in that program to learn how to play guitar, congas, piano never learned anything mm -hmm. nothing nothing and um and i i just didn't know what to do and i knew that i liked the arts i like i like i love the arts and um i started drawing at home and one day my father told me that i should choose another career other than painting and drawing because it was in the way that i would be able to raise a family or even keep food in the refrigerator because artists starve mm-hmm I only understood this as I got older that he was telling me this, but yet he was an artist himself. So he probably had an idea. He was working totally he was, from experience. He was talking from experience mm -hmm. that he was a guitarist. He wasn't making a living from that. And he was doing another job. He was working he was, other, other he, was, he was He was working as a baker. As a baker. As a baker for a bakery in Brooklyn. And... Um, he, when he mentioned that to me, when he told me that he didn't, he expected me to do something different and not get into the arts, I mentioned to him that the reason why I wanted to do the arts was because I loved doing it. I wasn't doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be an artist, not for the money, but because of the passion that I had for, for drawing and painting. And, uh, and then I, I went to the High School of Art and Design. I studied at the High School of Art and Design. Um, and it was where I really grew that passion by learning how to do different forms of art, silk screening, airbrushing, painting and drawing, architectural, drafting, all of that stuff they taught us there. And, um, and when I graduated there, um, I went to the Institute of Art in Denver, mm -hmm. Colorado. And I studied there. I thought I would want to get away from home because of the neighborhood and the environment and the amount of drugs that were in the environment. I thought, you know what, getting away from here for a little while and go away to study would be the best thing for me. I realized that I did not want to be away from home. So I came back home in six months. 
and I went back to studying art at uh, at a New York City uh, college. Okay, and I studied graphic designing and advertising design, and. After two years of uh, my two-year degree, associate's degree, I went on to working in the field of advertising design as a mechanical artist in the 80s. And uh, I worked my way up from a mechanical artist all the way to a creative director in advertising working in the field of art for 21 years with just an associate's degree, okay? Which was wonderful because I knew that the passion that I had for art was gonna take me somewhere. But well, while you were working at all uh, at these commercial jobs, right? Because there's one thing, this commercial art and then this fine art. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the, some, some say this, uh, you, you know, some, they break the line between one and the other. But I, I, while you were working at this commercial art, do you, did you have like a, an affinity to create like your own personal uh, style, your own personal view, point of view? Or? Yeah, I would say yes and no, because when I was working in advertising, there was so much work. There was so much time that I had to put into that mm. that I didn't even have time for my own work. For your own work. For my yeah. own work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, dealing with the clients, holding creative strategy meetings, uh, waking up at seven o'clock in the morning to be at work at eight, getting out of work sometimes at midnight, mm. you know, just wow. burning the, 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 the candle from both ends. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was not as easy to be able to do the work that I've been doing recently. But I did do some work. I always went home and I sat down and I sketched. Or I did some paintings, little things, not always big pieces. Um, but then once I left the field of advertising that I decided to become a teacher, an educator here in New York City, um, I started getting more into what I really loved doing and that was the painting and the drawing. Okay, the graphic arts was wonderful, but I realized that I liked the hands-on stuff, like really doing stuff with my hand, being that, that draftsman. Um, whereas with advertising, we were using computers to create a lot of the stuff then, okay? Uh, typography was being done by machines. Mm -hmm. um, the images were illustrated by outside illustrators and then we'd then put them in the computer and we'll manipulate them and do whatever we can. I guess that all of that really taught me how to have a really keen eye to creating my own work today, okay? Because I like fine tuning my work. I like working with details. If I don't have something that, that takes time in creating, I don't want to show it. Okay, there were a few pieces in this in the show that I that I took. Yeah, time your, at the your end. work is very elaborately uh, uh, painted. You know, it's very fine details, and uh, and you see that the work is not is is not it is it, work that takes concentration, planning, and execution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Precise ex execution. Yes. You know, yes. you're not just doing like uh, 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 abstract uh, brush strokes, or, mm -hmm. or you're not doing you, you're not doing uh, impressionism or anything like that. It's an exact uh, representation of the idea, and uh, so it's, it's not easy for me to be able to show that brush stroke. Or do an abstract. You don't show the brush stroke. You, I don't you show don't the brush stroke. I, I, the, I, I the brush prefer stroke. I prefer it being clean and precise. There's something about it. I, I I'm not really sure. Um, I I think it has a lot to do also with my training in in advertising and design. How everything has to be clean mm -hmm. and things have to be exact. All right. And so when I started doing my paintings, I sort of leaned to the edge of making sure that those lines are crisp, that the shadows are right, that the lighting is correct, that the way that the eye looks is really what it looks like, okay? And not just expressionistically putting it down and putting a spot or putting a color mm -hmm. and things like that. And I've tried it. It just doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I feel uncomfortable doing it. So I have to have that 20-0 that brush 
to be able to create those fine details like on those feathers over there, okay? Or the fine detail that you see on the, um, on the earring. I have to have those really, really small details, details. in there mm -hmm. in order for me to feel comfortable with mm -hmm. the work that I do. Okay. Yeah, because those details are sort of like the jewels in the work, you know? Uh, when you find one, you say, oh my God, look at this, you know? Yes, it's yes. It's like a jewel, you find a jewel. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a work and then all of a sudden you, you, you focus on a detail and that detail itself uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it's like the highlight or one of the highlights Thank you. Thank in, you. in general you know mm -hmm. you have a general highlight then all of a sudden you see little start seeing little details and and that that takes you into another realm you know? so, yeah and that's the realm yeah. that I get into when I'm doing my work I, I'm, I'm at home and I work in this in my in my home it's my home is my studio and when I'm working I'm looking at the work and I sit down and I start wondering, okay, there is something that has to go in there that has to be pristine, it has to be clean, it has to be sharp, and it has to be the focal point, okay? There has to be some kind of emphasis in that work that's gonna draw the attention of the viewers, okay? And, um, you know, I, I show my work here right now and I'm looking at all my work and I don't even look at my work at home. I don't hang any of my work. I have nothing on my walls that have anything to do with my work. Only two pieces in the drawings. Um, but when I take them out and I start looking at them and the other day I came here and I started walking around and I started myself really observing my work in detail. And I'm saying to myself, how did you do that? Yeah. Okay, I ask myself, how did you do that? And people ask me, how do you do that? I don't know, but I just do it. I just do it. I guess that, that zone that I get into when I'm doing the work and just the researches that I do when, I'm actually, when I actually want to do something that looks like that object, I have to spend hours in research looking at these things before I can start creating it. And some of the times my paintings sit on my canvas for two months before I even do another brush stroke on it or do anything else on it. Um, I've done pieces in here that's taken me four months to work on, okay? And it's not that they should take that long because I know that if somebody didn't have a job, they would be able to do it probably in two weeks or in a week, right? But I don't like working on it continuously because you tend to lose the focus and the details that you want to put in it. Mm -hmm. When you walk away from it or when I step away from my work, when I see it for the second time, I realize that there are things that I want to put in there and things that need to be adjusted and things that need to be fixed or things that need to be added to it. And so I do that instantaneously and then I leave it alone and then I go back to it maybe two or three days later. So there's a lot in the process, in my process, how I look at my work and how I do my work. So, uh, so in this work that you have here, we have two galleries of your work. That spans of the time. What, what span of time do you do you recollect that this work covers? I'm like going to say it's probably two years, three years. No, it's five, from. Uh, I'm going to say. 2009, 2009 to today, to today. 20, 20, so roughly about, uh, what? about 13, 13 years. years, about 13 so about years, 13. 14 years, yeah. yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. about 14 years of work, but then there was a time that I stopped painting when I was working in advertising. I didn't pay for 10 years. Mm -hmm. For 10 years, I just didn't do any work at all, nothing. Um, and then one day I, I just woke up and I said, you know what, this is my passion. This is what I live for. This is what I, like, I felt very, I'm going to say, not in a state of depression, but unhappy because I wasn't doing what I really sought myself out to do in my life. And then, uh, and then I started doing it. Once I started doing it, um, I, I just didn't stop. And I'm not stopping. Not stopping. This is forever. This is until I'm ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about uh, before, prior to this uh, conversation, about 
art as a healing tool. Mm. And you express some some experiences that you had yes. had in your teaching uh, career mm -hmm. uh, related to that. Can you maybe uh, uh, relate some of those uh, sure, stories? Sure. You know, yeah, that's, that's, like that you mentioned to me. That's one of the things I th I, I believe that. That's one of the things that I believe that really brought me back to continue doing the work that I do. Um, while, while teaching, um, I, I went on to get uh, three master's degrees, but my third, my third master's was the most important one, which was uh, in art therapy. Okay, I went to, um, I went to NYU and I, um, I applied for an art therapy master's degree program and I was accepted and I went in there and while I was doing that program, I started realizing that the reason why I was doing it is because I wanted to bring it into the classroom, working with uh, children with behavior and emotional disabilities, uh, with autism, and some of them had, you know, mental issues, okay, mental disabilities, like they were bipolar, some of them suffered from, um, from uh, multiple personalities, okay, and I had to work with these kids and I had to find a way to be able to get to them so that they can at least have that moment in which they can express themselves and be either stress-free or their environment changes by the state of mind that they're in while they were creating art, okay? And while working with them, I realized that doing art for self-expression in the classroom with these students changed a lot of their ways of behavior. Some of them would come in and they would work mm -hmm. and they would sit down doing the work and while they were working, they would be in this zone. And I realized that that zone I used to get into and I still get into those zones where everything around me just doesn't exist anymore. It's only what I'm doing that exists. And I realized that when I got into that and through my experience of doing my work, I felt that that was something that I could bring into the classroom. And my students were getting into that zone and I would explain that to them, I would tell them, I would tell them, this classroom is loud when you first come in here. But once you're in that zone of creating your work, you're in a different state of mind and that state of mind is yours. Yours to be able to contemplate and sit down and do something that takes you away from everything that affects you. And I've noticed that in the past 23 years working with students with emotional behaviors and, and mental issues and even physical issues, um, I've seen a lot of changes in a lot of students and even to the point that they knock on my door because they want to be in my classroom because they want to do art with mm -hmm. me. I guess because of the environment and the aura that I bring into the classroom and the peace that I bring in. Okay, because I like easiness. I don't. I don't like noise. I don't like craziness. I want everyone around me to feel my energy and my peace, and that's what I bring into the classroom. Even the even the the director, the principal in the school, she walks into my classroom and she tells me, Mr. J, and that's what they call me, Mr. J. Your classroom is so peaceful. I just want to stay in here. Okay, so I guess that has a lot to do with the therapeutic sense of the room. Do, and do the you work. think the system maybe uh, should uh, change and, and, and start the class day with an art with an art session? I would I believe that that would you be know, wonderful. That, that, might that would be, be wonderful. A, a way yeah. to uh, like uh, and, and maybe even Mr. Change Mr. over Dimas, the whole system. Yeah. You know? I, I think that I believe that that would probably be something really great to do in an entire group. Like to really have everyone, everyone doing yeah. some form of art first thing in the morning before mm -hmm. going to their classes. Before going to the classes, okay? yeah. Before going to their classes. Mm -hmm. Because it allows them to express themselves and to feel at ease in the way that they wish to express themselves mm. without any, having any demands or any direction before they can go in and start doing what they right. have to do for the rest of the day. Because it's been said that doing art allows you to be able to do other things in school, the other curriculums, and, and, and be successful, okay? 
give them a chance to uh, to exercise their thinking. It's a you meditation. Know, meditation. Meditation. It's a meditation. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the zone. Yes. The zone is the meditation. Okay. Um, and when they get into that, you can see it. You can instantaneously see when someone is in that zone because their eyes are focused, their hands are doing this. And they're constantly working on it, and they're picking up another pencil, and they're not saying anything to anyone, not even to their peers next to them, that they're constantly either badgering or wanting to bully. But during that, those sessions, there's none of that happening, which is really, really wonderful. And I've noticed that in my years working in, in the schools. And they're coming in contact with who they really are, like who they are personally. I, you know, figuring out their identity. Right. Because instead of the cookie cutter identity that everybody has to learn Absolutely. the mathematical subject, everybody has to, art is free, you know, it's free. It's free, it's, free. it's like, like a free form. Discover yourself. Yeah. It's sort of like they get into their own, uh, their own character. Yeah, they're, 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 who they are. One who of they the, are, their personality, yeah, their own yeah. personality. So one of the things, yeah. and as you're saying, um, I, I've also realized that it develops a real strong sense of self-esteem. Totally. They come up and they get up with their work and they say, look what I did. Look, at, and, and some of them walk in telling me, oh, I don't know how to draw. I can't do this. This is not for me. And I said, don't worry. I'm going to show you how to draw. I'm going to show you how you can really do this, okay? And I know that you can. And what they do is when they, they, they do the work, it's amazing. They come up and they say, oh, can I show this to my, can I show this to the security guard downstairs? Oh, yeah. Or they say, oh, I'm going to do this for, for the teacher upstairs. Can I give it to them? I said, you do as you want, but make sure you sign your work mm -hmm. so that they know that you did it, mm -hmm. okay? But yes, yes, it, it does develop a good sense yeah. of, okay. of, of self-esteem on the students, yeah. Uh, not only on the students, on everyone. It's yeah. an interesting concept, but I don't know why, why... Yeah. They haven't thought about it yet. Yeah. I don't <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things that they're still looking at. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm connected with um, with NYU and art therapists that graduate from there. And they, they've been trying to incorporate art therapy in the schools as one of the programs for District 75, which is for the disabled. Is okay? that, is that like a not, pilot project? or They've been doing, well... I graduated from NYU in 2012 with my degree in, uh, in art therapy, in master's in art therapy. Uh, they've been working on that since, and they have had a lot of progress, okay? Because at that time, uh, an art therapist was not even considered like a social worker. Now they do have a license for them. Yeah. Okay, oh, they have licensed okay. creative art therapists, mm -hmm. okay? And they can charge services just like a regular social worker. Yeah, you know, but the art form. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we did, as, uh, that was the most valuable thing. Come yeah. in. I also had a sand tray box, which was very mm -hmm. good, and they played characters in here, so they developed storylines. But the kids... It, it was universal. Yes, it doesn't yes. doesn't matter whatever was going on. As long as you put some crayons and paint, it's able to communicate. That's great that you did that. Yeah, feeling. yeah. because a lot of counselors in the schools, all they want to do sometimes, I mean, what I've seen in the school where I'm at, uh, they, they have like Connect Four and little games and things yeah. like that. Nothing that has to do with the creative process or allowing your brain or your, 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 yourself to get into something that is going to take you into a zone mm -hmm. that is your own, exactly. okay? Um, which, which is really important because, like I said, I mean, when I'm doing my work, I'm in my zone. I don't even like to be called. I don't want to pick up the phone. I don't want to talk to anybody. While I'm doing work, please don't call me, okay? Because once you distract me, I have to refocus and try to get back onto where I was. And it's not as easy when you're already in it, okay? It's sort of like taking you out from, from here and throwing you up to another space in time and you don't know where you're at. Mm -hmm. So that's the same way when I'm on my artwork. When I'm on my artwork, I'm on that and I'm focusing and I'm looking, I'm looking at a few of my paintings right now and I'm staring at... Um, at the middle one and this one. And I remember when I started them, I just didn't like the way that the 
the the actual tones on the skin, which I'm using metallic colors for, were not coming out. I was seeing brush strokes. I didn't want to see brush strokes. I wanted to see it smooth. I want to see it smooth. And I continually worked on it. And it was like a zone. Like I must, I must have been on one of these pieces for about, I'm going to say about seven or eight hours one day just trying to work on it continuously. And then the next day, another five or six hours on it again. And then the weekend again for another two days but just to get it right. This is, not, this is all brush all paintbrush, no airbrushing no, uh, at all. No sponges, no nothing. All of that is using paintbrushes. There's a technique that I use, it's the dry brush technique. And so using that dry brush technique allows me to work layers and layers and layers of that same color, still allowing it to have depth. Right, because you have okay. the gold in there. Did you put the gold under or... Ah. No, there's no gold in there. That's all that's all bronze. It's the same color. It's the same purplish. The same purplish purple? the, that, that that color, that okay. purple is all the same color. Well, how did you get the skin tone to be so light and the hair tone? So light? Because that looks like okay, gold so, uh, so, paint. so when you when you take and you put the layers, the first layer is very light. Which is a gold. Which is, which is the bronze color, right. okay? It's, it's the first layer, and it's very light. The next layer would start bringing up those areas of highlight, which are the higher parts of the face, like on the nose, on the eyebrow, on the forehead, on the chin. You're okay. talking about the, the, the highlighting. Yeah, the highlighting area. So I continue to work that dry brush technique on top of it, until it builds up to the point that it starts becoming almost solid. Whereas the other colors underneath are very light tone that allows that purple to come through and create the shadows that is created. Oh, I would never have guessed that that purple and that gold tone yeah. was the same. They're all in the same. Color. They're all in the same. Yeah. <laughs> That, oh, that, that the gold outline, what, what color uh, was that? That, it's called bronze. It's bronze. It's a, it's a Utrecht uh, metallic bronze. And it's a it turns into purple. No, it doesn't turn into purple. The purple is the background. Oh, so I'm saying you had a purple background. Oh, yeah, no, you, I start off, I'm sorry, I didn't, oh, I didn't, okay. I didn't understand the question. Yeah, I start off with a purple background and then I work on top of the purple yeah. background. Yeah. So it is a process. It's a process, um, yeah, and it, and it's a it's it's a really it a real healing. Quality, which is so beautiful. You know, it's funny. It's startling. You look at it and it's like, oh, it looks so uh, advert. You know, it looks like professionally advertised, like a glossy like a, photo. Yes. Okay. But it's so, it's so you know what's funny that you said airbrushing. When I was at the High School of Art and Design in 1973. I majored in airbrushing. I, I made I made it I majored in airbrushing and I did it for a few years and I have all my airbrushes they put away I I never even looked at them again. I I work with all my brushes. Right, okay? So yeah. I, I I guess from looking at the airbrushing and the, the technique I can see the different that, values that and things like that. That was one of your influences then. That was one of my one influences. Of influences, yes. Yeah. 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 Airbrushing was one of my influences and silk screening was another one of my silk influences. Yes. yes. Yeah, it the looks like... The blue background and mm -hmm. the white, you just keep... And the silver, the silver on the top. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. These are all, the backgrounds are all painted uh, first and then I do my artwork on top of it, my, my, the actual images on the top of it. Do you do a drawing? For I draw, I draw, I draw, I draw them on there. I draw them with, with white pencil, with white charcoal pencil. Okay. If you look closely at some of them, you might see the white. Uh, but I try to get it out by using a little bit of water and a cotton swab to just remove it. Okay. But sometimes it looks nice that they're on there. You might might see it maybe on this one and on that one. Okay. But I do draw on my canvases before I do anything. I don't paint directly on my canvas. I draw first. I create the image on the canvas first. I have to have that precise drawing, that line there where I know that I'm going to put my paint exactly where I want it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So. I like how Marco said that 
there's like every once in a while you see a startling detail yeah. that totally captivates you and you go like, wow, that's really, like it just draws you in like um, the Frida one with yes. that earring. The earring, The yeah. one on the left with that little glow with the pearl With the it. pearl in it, yes, it's yes. Like, the alumbra. Uh -huh. <laughs> it brings you in, or in this one with the bank with the leaves around the neck. Yes, and yes. A little earring there. You know, and it's the other one with the hummingbird and those flowers, those pink flowers. Oh, the pink flowers it's on top. Yes. Surprise. Yes, it, yes. It doesn't almost like it doesn't quite belong there, mm -hmm. but it's perfect. Yeah. It has a surreal quality to it. Yeah. Surrealism is one of my I could tell my one, favorite. Dolly yes, yes. This, uh huh. You know, yeah, Dolly. Dolly was one of my my favorite artists when I was growing up. It was it was uh, Salvador Dali and Picasso. Mm. Okay, Picasso because of the cubism, and and Salvador Dali because of his surrealism. Okay, and and the, precision. and the precision of both their works. Okay, and Salvador Dali is like like really the one that I really, um, really, really lean towards when I'm creating my works. Um, I have many books of Salvador Dali at mm -hmm. home, mm -hmm. and and he was he was actually my first artist that I really enjoyed looking at his work when I was younger. Okay. Yeah, I enjoyed his work too. Yeah. When, when I was young, yeah. But then I got involved with the Chirico. Chirico, yes. The Chirico, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Chirico, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh -huh. good work too, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of very, very good artists that, I mean, that are influential in my life as an artist because, I mean, this is what I love. And if it's my passion, I have to love the works of other artists also. Yeah. Um, I didn't and, like and Picasso admired. too much till I understood what he was doing. What he was doing, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I liked his cubism, and I started doing a painting when I was, uh, I'm going to say, 1972. I started doing this painting that was a, my, my first large painting. Um, and it was not very successful, but it was cubist. It has these uh, weird perspective points of cubes and, and rectangles and triangles and things like that. And I, I, I was looking at it the other day because I still have the painting. Oh, you still have it, yeah. I was looking at it the other day. I said, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it, it's, it was it's, an exercise. It's a start. It was a start. An exercise. Yeah, it was a start. Yeah, it was a start. It was something, you know, I wanted to prove to my family that, yeah, I'm going to be an artist. Okay, and, and I, I, exactly. <laughs> with only one hand. It's, it's right? funny. It's funny. With one hand tied behind my back. <laughs> you know, you look, you look back at the years, and you, and you say to yourself, "Wow, look, look how far <laughs> I've come." You know, um, it's strange because I look at my work, and I have my family that comes down, and they don't see what I do. They don't. Not even my identical twin brother. You met him. Yes. Right? Yeah. So not even my identical twin brother knew the quality of work that I do because they don't see my work. He started seeing my work when I started bringing it to him for him to frame them because he's my framer. Oh, he's wow. the one that creates these frames for me. Lucky you. Okay. And um, he started looking at my work, and he one day he looks at me, he tells me, Albert, you're amazing. You did this? I tell him, you didn't know I did this kind of work? He tells me, not this kind of work. And I said, yeah, I've been doing it for a long time, so I, I should get better. I think, I'm, I think I'm getting somewhere now, I tell him. And he looks at me and tells me, no, this thing is really good. And I still, even till today, I look at my work and I'm, you know, like they say, you're your worst uh, Critic, critic, critic works. Yeah. Critic, uh, that is I. That is I. I've always believed that um, it's not there yet. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it, it's not there yet. I'm still working on that. I'm exploring. I'm experimenting. I found something that I like. And Where, I, when do you, which piece do you think you would define that? Wow, I found something I like. What was this? This series. this series right here. Oh, my mother. That was the first one. My yeah, mother was the my the first one that I that I that I did. Well, I did those drawings there, but mom was really something that I needed to do. And of course, the reason why it came out so beautiful because she was so beautiful. And I don't want to cry because oh God, this here, this here has made so many people cry. 
okay? Um, I had it at a show at NYU. NYU had a global calling for artists and I was accepted to show this piece of this piece. The curator called me one day and told me, Mr. Justiniano, your work moves people. I said, what are you talking about? He told me, there are people standing by your work and crying. And I'm saying, why? But then I saw it, by, I saw it with my own eyes when I showed my work at Boricua College Gallery on 155th Street. There was a lady that came in and she's looking at all of the artwork and she's standing by that work and she literally was bawling. And I went over to her, she said, did you create this work? I said, yes, I did. And she says, oh, I'm so sorry. I've never felt this way before. This one here? Yeah, yeah. So that was, that, that was an emotional piece that I created. And I guess that that's why it projects that to the viewers. Okay? And just like Mr. Marco said earlier, he said that my work extrapolates from, you know, your past experiences. And, oh, and, and. Our, our, our people in in paint just yes like yes mothers or yes yes you know, like this is classical yes classical yeah mm -hmm. yes yes and it's exact and you know but it's also surreal like i could see the dove above head yeah and yeah. the background ends there so it's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so like like they put that you know on tapestry gets the puero in la ventana or on the kitchen table pero está with your mother, yeah. what is she looking at? So, I mean, it's, it's like an interesting piece. Ella está mirando al nieto. A what? Al nieto. The grand, the great grandson. Okay, okay, that's what she's looking at. Okay, but the okay. way you did it. Yeah, like, yeah. What yeah. that tapestry, why? Yeah, well, it's, it's, mom, mom was a seamstress. Okay. Okay, she was a seamstress. Uh, she, she. She made that. She, yeah, thank you, thank you. And I had to, I had to do, I had to really get into the detail on that because it was her passion also, and because it was her passion, I wanted to really make it her. I wanted to make it so that it really represents who she really was, and and it took time. This one took me six months to do. Yeah, that painting there. That's okay. All? Yeah, that's all. But mm -hmm. the color, the gold in the background, mm -hmm. it has 15 coats of gold paint on there. Okay? There are 15 coats of gold paint on there. This one has 12 coats of, of the copper. Okay? In order for me not to see, as I was saying earlier, those brush strokes. So these were the first, and then... And then everything else started coming through. Yes. Then all of the others. Hi, so I come right say in. you're kind of getting into your own element. Yes, yes. Now it's when I'm feeling what it is to be an artist, okay? Now it's when I'm feeling what it feels to create from really deep inside, okay? Having the passion for it, okay? Good. Okay. Yeah, well, uh, well, you know, like, we're here, Tayo Boricua has been around for 54 years. Uh, we we uh, founded uh, Tayo Boricua in 1969 and uh, incorporated as the Puerto Rican Workshop Incorporated in 1970. And so we've been doing this, uh, exhibiting Puerto Rican artists, Latino artists, and Asian artists and black artists throughout our history. So, um, so this, this is just one more one more phase of the uh, of our history uh, of exhibitions here, you know. Uh, and we're fortunate to have you, and we are we're planning a few exhibitions coming up. That's why one of the reasons I asked you about about your experience with art therapy and art as a healing uh, tool is because we, we are having, I'm co-curating an exhibition coming up where the, the theme of it is art as a healing Fantastic. Uh, a vehicle, mm -hmm. tool or whatever. Yes, you know? yes. And, 
And that's very, a very important thing. And some of what you said is very important. So yes. for sure, the co-curator is going to be very pleased to review this. Uh, wow. This gets put into our archives. And we have a number of, uh, of interviews in our archives. If you go to tallerboricua.org, mm -hmm. you could see what's immediate. And you could go into the archives and and research past exhibitions. Okay. You know, so, nice. so this this is a new additive to that uh, to that component. But I'm honored. Yeah, because I'm honored. Yeah, no, so I really am. I'm honored to, we, to be here. We have to we have to maintain our institutions alive. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. We have to maintain our culture. Our culture is important. Alive. To alive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so well, that's what I do. When we started out, there was maybe 20 or 30 organizations. Right now, there's maybe one, maybe three or four left, you know? Really? Yeah. Wow. Wow. The New York and Poets Cafe is still there. They, yes, they started the about side. four years after we started. Mm -hmm. uh, and Centro de Estudio Puerto Riqueño is still there also. And... Um, but the Association of Hispanic Arts, Cayman Gallery, uh, 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 the uh, Instituto de Puerto Rico, the Teatro Moderno Puerto Riqueño, Johnny Colon Music School, yes, yes. Uh, the, the Boys Harbor Music School, they're all gone, they're all gone. Yeah, they're all Mira, gone. Yo te dije que era Tito Puente that I went to that school. No, yeah. it was Johnny. It was Johnny Colón. Johnny Colón. Johnny Colón it was Johnny school, Colón. Right. That was right there on Park, on Park Avenue, exactly. I think it was. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. The Johnny I Colón remember. Music School, right? Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be, they were supposed to be in this building. Yeah. Hmm. So anyway, so thank you very much. Uh, if you have any. Mr. Marcos. Yes, yes, sure. Any yeah, questions absolutely. from the audience or anything? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I got yeah. it because kind of, uh, Deep because you're talking about therapy, art, and stuff like yes. that. Yes. When you were in the high school of art and design, mm -hmm. uh, do you remember uh, a teacher by the name of Mrs. Frazier? Yes. Yes. Do, what was, was, how about Mr. Shine? Mr. Shine, I don't remember. He, when I was there, Mr. Shine was the music teacher. Mm -hmm. And in the high school of art and design, you had a gigantic... Uh, basement uh, with, with uh, music rooms. Yeah, it was like an orchestra, an orchestra room. I remember that. An orchestra. It's a whole really? Orchestra. Yes, yes. Back in those days, they allowed me to take a bass fiddle home on the weekends. I was living in the projects. And I would, do <laughs> and I would take it up on the number six, at numero six. Yeah. <laughs> home. Uh -huh. And I would even take it to the Bronx, the Hunts Point, uh, 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 at one point, you would take we, we a, used a rehearsal day. We had like a little salsa guru we were trying to do. Yes, yes. But it was amazing. That is gone. But you know that 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 was a great theater in art and design. Also, you remember the yes. auditorium? Yes. Oh, that yes. was huge. Like they had the they had the 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 class that used to create the stage sets. And those stage sets were almost oh, wow. like immaculate. They were like like you were in a in a in a in a play on Forty Second yeah, Street. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean it was a huge theater, and I remember those rooms. Now I now I can I can picture them. Yes, okay, yes. Um, I saw so, Dolly there. They had him there. Uh, Dolly was there. I don't know. He might have been gone by the time you were. What years. What year were you there? I'm four years uh, ahead of me. Yes. Okay, so I was there. Uh, Seventy five is when I graduated. I graduated with with Miss Elsie Delise in the background who is also an artist yeah so uh, no I don't remember Ms. I, I, I remember I, I remember Miss Glicksman uh -huh. which was silkscreen Mr. Teichman which was airbrushing Mr. Gonzalez which was uh, three three dimensional paper cut I mean paper sculpting and sculpting mm -hmm. um, Mr. Nagley who was the um so what, is, what was it? Yearbook, yearbook and advertising. Mm. Okay, uh, so there were there were quite a few. I, I'm I'm going to say this right now because if it wasn't for those teachers who had inspired myself and you and Elsie to do what we do, we wouldn't be doing this for so long. This is over 55 years 
of creating art, okay? And not letting it go, because there was some, some of our, our peers have gone to become police officers, uh, have yeah. gone to do other things other than art because they didn't think that it was going to be either lucrative or that they were not gonna make a living in it or what have you. But you know what? When you have a passion and that passion is deep, it becomes lucrative. But what drives that passion is interesting because I was I, I had a passion, but the passion I had in those days was almost like it was uh, prevalent in the in the in the nineteen sixties of music. Everybody wanted to be a superstar. Exactly. So yeah. here I'm going to artists because I you know, I read about Picasso and all that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Fraser was interesting because I used to say to myself, man. She's such a good artist, but she's she's only teaching. She's a teacher. She's not a Picasso. Why isn't she? Why isn't why she, she out famous? There, you know? Yes. And of course, back in those days, I everybody, you know, the uh, I don't know about in your time, but it was a uh, uh, if you graduated out of art and design, the only quick jobs were pay up mechanical. That's what I went into. Okay. okay. And I said, and that was like eighty dollars a week, and I said, hmm. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, 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 but every one of my brothers were into the music then. They were all into music, okay? I guess he believed that, that they would become superstars one day, all right? And that me doing painting and drawing, I was not gonna go anywhere with it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think he was right. He was right in a sense, but wrong in this sense, because I'm still doing this, and I've been successful with it. And I've not stopped doing art my whole entire life. And I've had jobs in the art field. I've been teaching art all my life. It's all I've been doing. I've done nothing other than art my whole entire life in work and in my real life, mm -hmm. in my life, right? But, but he's right also because I have two brothers that were in the music and became Grammy nominees, okay? So he had, he had an inclination. He had an idea. He had the right idea. But he wasn't giving it a chance. And I gave it that chance. Yeah. I gave it that chance. I decided to give it that chance. Because, yes. Uh, what happens to a lot of people, they get swayed away because of other factors, you know, like economics or whatever. Your brother is, oh, but go into music. There's more money in music. There ain't nothing music in what you're doing. So right. That was it. So I, I think if, if uh, with, with children coming up, uh, adults, if we could just, you know, for, for stall that thing about fame and all that stuff and just focus on the creativity. One of the things I do when I'm doing my teaching is that allow the student to do what they do the best way that they can and just follow that passion. Don't worry about anybody telling you what you're not capable of doing. If you believe in what you do, you will achieve that in which what you believe. Okay? Um, I... I don't tell my students how to draw. I don't tell them how to paint. I give them the materials and I want you to explore it. You can call me and ask me, Mr. J, what do you think I should do? And you know what I tell them? Do what you feel you should do. It's your work, not mine. Okay? Because I want them to feel that, that confidence of being able to do that in which they can do without having been told this is the way you should do it. Because if I tell you how to do it, you're not really going to find that, that little niche of yours. If I tell you how to draw it, you're not going to explore how you can draw it. Because you don't have to draw like I draw. You draw it the way that you draw. Your drawings are different than mine. Your paintings are gonna be different than mine. You do it the way that you feel you want to express yourself, and then you name it what it is. Because that is what you felt while you were doing it.
So this is how I teach my kids. I don't, I don't tell them anything in the way of, oh, you should become a police officer, or you should go into a school where they're going to give you a vocation and you can learn to be a mechanic. No, tell me what you want to become and just follow that dream. Okay? Because that's what I did. My father told me that this was not the right career. I, I agreed with him, but then I disagreed. I think they all came from the same the school because my father did the same thing. Oh, that's great. You love art and you love music and you love poetry, but you got to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the funny thing you have to make. You can buy some. You got to get yes, a yes. slave. Yes, yes. I hated that. And that's why you couldn't college because I couldn't figure it out, right? I yeah. Like make one choice. Because you were told that you shouldn't do that even though you wanted to. All three of them. And there you go. <laughs> Look at that. Decision and, I'm, and I didn't want to bother them with the college and all that, but. Just going back, it's so important to have people like you and Marcos and all of us, you know, yes. in the teaching people. Yes, you know, absolutely, was, absolutely. I remember all my teachers who, who tapped me on and said, wow, that's good. Yeah. And just that alone changed everything for me. I still remember all the names. Miss Fine, Mr. Talbot for sculpture, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mr. Mon was singing. It just... Those people are the inspired. Those they, are the they are heroes. How are our heroes? Yeah. 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 Of, yeah. My hero was you know, was in television, junior. Uh, you know, these are real people. Yeah. Yeah. My hero was in junior high school, in the ninth grade. Ninth grade, Miss Steinhauer discovered that I had a talent for art, and worked with me to get into the high school of art. I know. Mm. Look at my paintings today. Do you think that this artist could have gone into the High School of Art and Design? Do you think so? Well, I wasn't accepted to the High School of Art and Design, even though I applied for it, and I submitted a portfolio, and they told me that I did not get accepted. Did I didn't. Go high and I did. I didn't give up. Oh, good. You kept trying. I didn't give up. I went to the Puerto Rican Association, Aspira. Aspira, yeah. And I told them that I was not accepted to the High School of Art and Design. Can you review my portfolio and see if I can get in? Oh because wow. I will not go to any other school. I will drop out wow. if I did not get accepted to the High School okay. of Art and Design. So, so you had a lot of confidence in yourself on some level. Tick tock, tick tock. How many years later? 55 years later, 60 years later. I'm here with my artwork in the gallery. I wasn't accepted to art and design. Yeah. Why? Yeah, you knew. I knew. You didn't. You I knew. Didn't. I knew. I knew that that's what I wanted. My father told me that this is what I should not be doing. Right. And I agreed, but I disagreed. Said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. But that's what I'm going to do. Because mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. Because I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it because I have a passion for it. Because it's what, it's what was given to me from the day of conception. It's my gift, and if I have this gift, I will nurture it, and I will show that in which gifted me this gift, that I will continue to do it as long as I live, because it's what you made me do. It's what you got me here for. And so that's why in most of my paintings, if you look around, Mama has a rosary. Jesus Christ, he's the king in a chess piece. Mm -hmm. The foot is on the serpent. And you have that little figure with an apple next to her begging for forgiveness. Okay? And then you have on the paintings on that end, you're going to find crosses and rosaries which represent my thanking for that gift in which I've received. On that one behind you also has another one. This has the rosary on it. That one has a rosary. If you look at that, that sculpture that's uh, called the Tenement's Guardian on the corner, that piece, if you look at the forehead, it does, it does have a cross. It's just embedded in the sculpture. Okay? Okay? It's there. It's there. Has to be there. Okay? That one behind you has the cross right in that 
piece, okay? And then if you go over there to the next one on the other side, you're gonna see a lot of them that have crosses. And the reason why they have those crosses is because I want to make sure that I represent that in which gave me this gift. This is the only way that I can do it. And I don't want to cry. But anyway, that's what it is, okay? Right? Yes? You mentioned really? that, that point when uh, yeah, it was yeah, speed up. Yes. With, with this. Well, who told you no, that you should, you know. Yeah. But what, for you, what, what was, when did you, what day or what time of uh, your life did you realize, that, wait a minute, I have a gift? I was 12 years old. I was 12 years old, and I realized that I l enjoy drawing, and it would be my pastime. I would not do anything other than that, okay? There were times that my parents would knock on my door and tell me, come out to eat. And I would be drawing. I would be painting. I'd be doing crazy stuff, painting and drawing and, and creating stuff that some of it I look at today and I say, wow, well, I did that. I said, that's crazy. What the hell was in my mind? But, um, but I used to spend a lot of time doing that. And, and I realized that that's, that's when I realized that I was, that that's what I wanted to do. So you were 12? I was 12. Okay. I was 12. Did it on what, any particular piece? Was it one piece that kind of... <laughs> I did a painting. It was a large painting. And it was symbolic. It was a mother and child. I was looking at uh, Michelangelo's Pieta. How she was carrying Jesus, right? And... I did this painting, and I have it rolled up. It's on linen. I have it rolled up in a tube at home. I think I might have done that when I was like 14 years old. Okay? And it has this Indian red figure. It's just don't, no details. I couldn't do details because I wasn't good enough for that but I had these lines, it was more graphic, okay? And it had the breast of the mother and then the head of the child would be connected to it, okay? And that's when I realized that I wanted to be an artist and it didn't matter what it took, I was going to do this. And it didn't matter what anybody said, I was going to do this. And I went ahead and I just followed my, I followed my heart. I followed my heart. And it's still there. Mm -hmm. And it's still there. Okay? And it's still ticking. Okay? If it wasn't for art, I don't think I'd be around today. So it's people like you that can now shed and spread that, that experience yes. to them. Yes, absolutely. In a, in a way they can pick up on it. And I do that in my classrooms, and just like you were saying, that it takes us to be educators, to be able to spread that word that there is, that there's real life in this kind of stuff, okay? That it's not just a, picking up a pencil and drawing or saying, can I have paper and pencil I want to draw? I want you to draw, but I want you to draw. Tell me what you want to draw. Or why don't you draw something from your feelings, from your emotions, or something that you might have experienced that you were unable to talk about, but maybe you could put it down on paper, okay? Um, that's how I do my work. I Like right now, I'm working on a few paintings at home, and I'm just thinking about family. Like, I'm getting older, I have grandchildren, and I want my grandchildren to have something tomorrow that they can talk about, that they can have history, because that's what art does. <coughs> And, um, and, my, and my work is always to be able to leave something behind where people can look at it and say, wow, this is interesting. Um, Puerto Rican artists did this. Question, why did you pick Rita Palo? I mean, besides, we know she's beautiful. And Sorrow. Puerto Rican, right? Sorrow. No, she's not Puerto Rican. Okay. But she also has dealt with pain just as every single one of us has dealt with pain. We've gone through traumatic things in our lives. Uh, why not her? Okay? She, can, she represents that really, you know, wholeheartedly. Um, just her story alone tells it. 
And while teaching in my classroom, teaching of various artists, because I do teach a little bit of the art history and I talk about artists, their backgrounds and things like that. And I have students do some works of those artists so that they can get a feel of how that artist may have been feeling when they created their works. So I decided to create Frida Kahlo because of her pain, but I wanted to create her in the three precious stones because she is so precious, okay? Not only because she's Frida Kahlo, but she was a woman, okay? My mother was, is a woman. My sister is a woman. My daughter is a woman. I have granddaughter, okay? They all should be treated right. And so I decided to create her in gold, in copper and in silver, the precious metals. And I decided to do her in the beauty that she was, okay? But instead of putting the thorns around her neck because she did that because she wanted to represent her pain, I turned those thorns into a beautiful ornate earring to make her beautiful instead, okay? Her husband, who was the really cause of her pain, and her anguish and her agony, worse than the accident that she had on the bus, I decided to hang him also. Hang him. Oh, he's in her hang him on what her earring. Okay? Wow. So she turned him into an object now. And that object she can carry around forever because she loved him despite the fact that he did the things that he did to her. Hmm. Okay? And then. This one over here is silver. If you look at her finger, she has a ring with an eye. And that eye is the watchful eye that she should have had from day one. Protecting. Protecting her. Okay? So there's a reason for me creating these because I want them to be representative of women today, the pain that we all deal with and the sorrow that we deal with, and, and all of the trauma that goes with it. Okay, and so I, I made, the yeah, yes, yes. And so I made them beautiful. I made, I, I purposely made them to be beautiful. Okay, so that you don't see her in that way in which she had painted herself. Now there's going to be a show at the, at the gallery on 99th Street. Uh, one of our, our colleagues from uh, the High School of Art and Design that's also an artist, Annie. She's going to be showing. She has a one-man show downstairs that opens up next week. And she does a lot of Frida Kahlo because she suffered some really serious ailments in her life. That, that's her muse and everything that she creates. But she creates these beautiful shadow boxes and sculptures that she does. And she actually creates these paintings of her. The paintings of Frida Kahlo that she did, she creates them in 3D sculptures. So, really interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's the reason why I created these because, um, you know, it's, it has to do with the belief that um, women should be represented in, in a beautiful way. Okay? And she should be. She should be because she deserves it. Okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, Willie, any questions? Any, any more questions, questions or anything? Anybody have a question? Uh, too many questions. Too many. Do, does anyone, any, anyone, any one of the new people that came in have any questions? Those are my grandchildren. Those are just three of my grandchildren. So I'm, oh, and this one here. That's my grandson, Elias. My, I have, I have uh, six and two step-grandchildren. So this is Elias. This one is Zion. That's Nayakima. And that's Shia. Okay. So they, those are my, my new series that I've created, and that new series is called The Indigenous Faces. Okay? Although they might be not, they might not look like they're from a culture of the Indian background, but they are, they, they're Jamaican, Puerto Ricans. Taino Puerto Rican, Jamaicans have Tainos also. Mm -hmm. So these are the indigenous faces of today. Of today. So, El Taino no se ha muerto. We say the time, the, the whole Taino area. Yeah, el, pero el Taino no se ha muerto. Yeah. Okay, they say that Taino is, 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 has been, uh, what do they say? Dissolved? Ex 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 extinct. 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 They say that they're extinct? No, it's still in our blood. My mother was Taino. Mira mi, my, 
No me diga que esa no era Taina because she was. Okay? She was. Look at the nose. Look at that hair. Okay? Look at her color. Okay? She was Taina. And she used to talk about it too when she was alive. Okay? Yeah, she used to talk about it. That she was she was from the Taina culture. Yes, yes, yes. Mom, ella vivió en San Germán. Yes. And my, my father was from Mayagüez. Mm -hmm. I was born here in Los Estados Unidos. Yo soy el New York Rican, representando. <laughs> representando, exactly, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And I don't have a problem saying that, okay? I don't have a problem saying that. But, um, but this is my work, this is my life. And this will be my life until the good Lord tells me it's time for me to go see him. Okay? Yeah. And return to him so that he can then tell me that I think you did a good job. Yeah, then, mm. then you're going to have to paint him. I'm going to have to. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Well, I did. Go look over there. You'll see the painting of... Oh, okay? <laughs> He's over there. He's over there. Okay? And La Sangre Sagrada. Okay? La Sangre Sagrada is a painting that I did that represents the... Not only La Sangre... La, la Sagrada Sangre de Jesús, pero La Sagrada Sangre de Familia. And if you see all of the prayer cards there, that was inspired by the COVID, the first... And 20... What is it? 20... 20, that's 20, 20, 20, 20, it, it was three years ago, three years ago or four years ago, 2020. that's when I painted I that, I was walking through my, my corridor in my apartment and I just started crying because I saw the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that were dying and I started crying and I pulled out that canvas and I put it on my easel and I started looking at it and all of a sudden that's what came out. So it has all those prayer cards. And all those prayer cards represent the people who have passed. Wow. Okay? And so there could be many more. You know yes. Are. Yes, yes, yes. They're all people that I know. And wow. a matter of fact, it's my family. And so I had a list of people that have passed. And I could only fit that many because I wanted to make a balance on the artwork. I, you know, when I do my work, I, wanna, I don't want to add too many things and throw it off or whatever. So I only was able to create for a few. But, oh yeah, yeah, ese, ese el gallo protegido who um, has survived Maria. And if you see on the, on the fence, you got the, the, the flag, but it's in shreds. Okay, you have to look at it, okay? And then, and there's, and él tiene el azabache on his, on his little ankle, if you look at it. Tiene el coquí to alert him of any more harm. And he has the rosary. On, around around his collar, um, and then if you look on the floor, you have the uh, glass, um, the whiskey glass, spilling onto the dirt for those who have passed, during the Maria. Okay, so that was another piece that I created during that time. So it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot to to handle internally. So I express it in my work. Okay, and that's how I do it. Okay. So with that said, yes, sir. Your, your, your thoughts on artists in Puerto Rico around this time, and maybe when you grow up, you got any insights of your own by either going there or? Going to Puerto Rico, yeah. I, I actually, you know, like the cock and things like that, those things stayed in my head because my cousin that lived in Bayamón had a bunch of them in the backyard, and... Um, and they used to wake me up in the morning. They were so damn noisy. It just drove me crazy. That was you. But but that was me, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but they love it. They love it. Uh, and um, and and it was interesting because a lot of that stuff also stuck with me. It's like the the stuck with the thai, you know, the the things with the with the with the fighting cocks and uh, you know the 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 religion and the spiritualism. Okay. Espiritismo también estaba en mi casa. Okay, mm -hmm. we we talk about we talk about religion and how religion is. You know, I know that the Tainos had their own beliefs of the suns and the gods and all of that stuff. But then when the when the Spaniards came in, they try to give them the Catholicism and tell them that they had to believe in God and they had to pray to the cross and all that stuff. Okay, and all of that stuff didn't make any sense. Okay, and so. Um, 
I decided to do my father, the Indian. Okay? That's padre. Uh, my father was, my mother was Catholic. My father was a spiritualist. And they lived in the same home. Mm-hmm. Santero, Santero. Espiritismo. Yeah. No, Espiritismo, no Santero. Espiritismo is different. Two different it's, it's things. Espiritismo, no, he was in the whites. He was Santero. Él es Santero. El espiritismo es una, una práctica que nació en Francia. Mm-hmm. It was a, a European practice, spiritualism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was brought over to the Caribbean, and a lot of our people practiced, practiced it. it. Yeah. They didn't practice uh, 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 Santerismo. Santerismo was in Cuba. In Cuba. Right. That's, a, that was That's the Cuba. white. So who were their entities? They, they, well, they, they also had Chango, and they had, you know, uh, uh, El Sabino, uh, they had uh, different, El Indio, okay, they still had all of those, okay? Um, it's like the Christians of the Cowboys. You know, eso lo, eso lo, eso, eso, eso lo que me, me, me mantenía yeah. a mí decente, porque yo le tenía miedo. I don't know the, me estaban know. velando, okay? <laughs> Ellos decían, te están velando, y venía mi tía... No, el, el, espiriti, el, el espiritista, my, my, my father. My grandfather. Yeah. My, grandparents, <laughs> my grandparents practiced espiritismo. Yeah, my father was. My They father, practiced yeah. espiritismo. Yeah. I, I, for the lack of me, I said, no. Mira, I can't understand. Yo, yo, yeah, no, yo, cuando, there, yo cuando joven, But, esos brincos que decían ellos me mandaban al cuarto temblando, ¿ok? Porque era como si estuvieran este, en, otro, en otro mundo. Y de la manera que hablaban también But tenían... They, yeah, like, they would like, have seances yeah. and speak in tongues and different cómo, things. ¿cómo que not, like, not like Santerismo. Santerismo is, is an African-based yeah, yeah. uh, right. uh, mm-hmm. religion with, yeah. with, with, with Catholic... El santero, el, el santero de este, Dios, la gallina cortándole el cuello y todito eso, ¿verdad? El espiritismo no hace eso. No, 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 la, la, lo, el espiritismo no, no usa ropa. Right, right. My mother uh-huh. was too, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah. Are they really decent? They, you know, yeah, they yeah. Right. Square, yes. Yeah. But they would speak in tongues. So they that painting in tongues, was inspired by that. Get, get, get the spirit inside.